In a good season, Keita, a 26,000 hectare farm near Moree in New South Wales, produces 80,000 bales of cotton. After harvest, the cotton is sent to the nearby Wathiga Gin. Keita's owners, Daniel and David Statham, own a 50% share. From farm to gin, there are multiple carbon emission pressure points. We've been measuring our emissions now for over five or six years. 80 to 85 per cent are in two products. One's fertiliser and the other one's fuel. They're the two biggest components of our emissions. Nitrogen is your biggest emission. That's the number one. Number two is diesel. So it is the second biggest emission on a farm. So you could get to zero on both? You can get to zero on both. That's the plan. To reduce the cotton and cropping operations carbon footprint, the Stathams are investing in renewable energy to radically cut diesel, electricity and fertiliser use. A nine megawatt solar farm with battery storage is the first of a three-stage solar project. The gin used to have an electricity bill nudging a million dollars a year. We're keeping net zero at the point of connection for the cotton gin uh, for around 14 hours a day. The plant can power the cotton gin and still export 3.3 megawatts to the grid. It's like having your own private power station to cover your electricity costs. In August, the Stathams and a green energy company received a grant of nearly $36 million from the New South Wales government to build an ammonia and green hydrogen plant next to the gin. It will produce low emission green replacements for diesel and fertiliser. And it's a showcase for what other valleys can do. It's not just Moree, it's the Eastern Seaboard of Australia. We can produce our own fuel and fertiliser. We can control our own destiny instead of worrying about wars and things you can't control. We use approximately 2 million litres of diesel today. The hydrogen plant will produce 1.5 million. Replacing urea fertiliser with anhydrous ammonia will be an emission game-changer. Urea is 46% nitrogen. Anhydrous ammonia is 82% nitrogen. Urea is granular and it's a solid. It's a byproduct of petroleum. So therefore it's got a large emission factor around its production. Anhydrous ammonia produced from renewable energy has a zero carbon emission in the manufacturing of it. Every farmer's dream not having a fertiliser bill. 100%. My biggest dream. Uh, so David's confident the factory will open by June 2025. It won't make Kitar carbon positive because the Stathams claim it already is. David says using regenerative farming practices to preserve soil moisture has increased carbon levels. Carbon's money now. Yeah. Carbon's money. You can say that again. For 20 years, soil tests were done in every field every second year. While early reports provided soil carbon numbers, little attention was paid. Now customers are demanding that sort of data, and they have it. And carbon is now top of mind? 100% top of mind. The uh, European Union are leading it, and we're getting customers from all around the world wanting to come to farm, understanding what we do and pull those carbon credits that we create on this farm uh, through the supply chain and into their balance sheet. You're not going to sell them? Not selling them, no. Transfer insetting is, where, is the direction I'm heading. Insetting is where farmers keep credits for the additional carbon they build and use it to offset their emissions. A lot of biomass going back into the soil. But you need proof to trade in the climate smart economy and that has to come from independent certifiers. The Stathams use a UK satellite carbon measuring company and a Brisbane advisory and verification business. So will the soil testing and the satellite pictures help you prove to your customers that you're not greenwashing, you're not mucking about? 100%. Like, I'm, I haven't done this for, for money. I've done it because I'm interested in the soil. I want to do things well. Um, and the people that come here, they want rigour. They want rigour around the numbers. And that's one thing that we've got. We've got every record of every single pass every single, single operation, every single input that's gone into every field for the last 20 years. So if they want data, you can show it to them. Oh, exactly right.
Being carbon positive is just part of the Statham's new approach. They've branded their cotton and can track it anywhere in the world after it leaves the gin. They say it's the world's only climate positive traceable cotton. We're going through from a really nice knit from Portugal to a woven... For Danielle, a former fashion designer, it all started with a question in a paddock. And then into a cord. I couldn't understand why I couldn't use that cotton in my own garments. The reason was, once their cotton left the country, the Stathams lost track of it. Most cottons from different regions have different quality parameters and then they're blended at spinning mills and that's where you lose visibility of what happens. Danielle found Paul Stenning, the inventor of identification technology used in paper for banknotes and passports. He just happened to be working on tracking cotton. I still remember the day I went into David in the office and I said, I've found something and I have to go to Germany and I have to go and see this guy. We've commercialised that, that product for him and taken that out to what we see now over the last five years. And he's now still with us in research and development. Mr Stenning invented a way of blending rare earth pigments invisible to the naked eye into cotton at the gin. There's about 400 grams of pigment per bale and it stays with the cotton for life. The pigments operate in an infrared wave band and we're actually able to create unique signatures for each of our customers. A strong signals uh, for the fiber. bar. The innovation's called Fibre Trace, which the Stathams have named the new company they co-own. A Bluetooth scanner physically confirms authenticity in real time. When cotton is scanned in and out of spinning, weaving, garment manufacturing and retail sites, the data, including a geolocation, is sent to the cloud. Within the platform, the pigment actually identifies the signature of that pigment and who's been assigned to that customer. And then we look at the intensity to make sure that the intensity signals are matching at each point within the supply chain. The signal is 100% here at the gin and weakens if the cotton is diluted. In the spinning process, if they mix that with different cottons, we can actually tell that there's been a reduction in that intensity and then can notify the brand that there's actually been some blending, authorised or unauthorised, and then they can actually get in in real time and actually stop it before that end product is actually a product and it's too late. With world trade entering a new world of emissions accounting and legislation, more governments and food and fibre buyers will require green digital credentials. So literally this now has a passport just like I've got a passport. This has a passport just like you've got a passport and every stage that this bale moves through we will know in real time where this product is. If you're not doing this in the future, you won't attract a premium or maintain the premium that Australian growers get. We have Rod and Gun coming on board, Anaconda taking shape, and then there's a lot of other brands that are, that are in the pipeline. The Stathams say they're paid a premium because global brands have made sustainable sourcing pledges and there's not much verified sustainable cotton around. We're seeing from $20 to $60 a bale in that range, subject to supply and demand. Extra. Yeah. The Maggie Marilyn brand, that oh, was right. Australian Fashion Week. In 2018, the couple sold 2,000 bales of good earth cotton. This year, they'll sell 80,000, and four growers have joined as suppliers. We've repurposed the building, so... Being able to supply at scale has put the brand on the fashion industry's radar. Come through, Pip. Danielle renovated an old machinery shed to give visiting fashion executives a cellar door type experience. They're used to being in a space where there is a little bit of luxury and comfort. People are coming from all parts of the world. They're not coming for a couple of hours just to sit in a tin shed and swelter in the middle of a cotton season. Here we have the lecture theatre. This is the lecture theatre isn't just for customers. Staff are continually updated on farm production figures and sustainability and technology goals and advances. And to continue to remain relevant within the market, and I hope you all understand that. Unusually, these staff know how many and which brands are buying the cotton they help grow. 
And where there's fashion, there are gift bags. This time to celebrate a t-shirt deal with Country Road. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Danielle's expertise is in fashion, marketing and cotton. And David's is technology, data and cotton. As a team, they say they're ready as climate makes agriculture more challenging. This is 100% coming at us like a bullet and it's not going away. You know, the, the climate change debate around the world and, and we're sitting in the box seat to do something about it. I think we're foolish to think that agriculture and commodity trading is not going to be disrupted when everything else has been disrupted. Mm.